Hey everyone, welcome to the Council of Trent podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist Trent Horn. And today I'm reviewing one of the most frustrating debates I've ever seen. But before I do that, if you like this video, please hit the like button. If you want more content like this to help you defend your faith, please hit the subscribe button. And if you want to help us grow and reach more people, please consider supporting us at TrentHornPodcast.com. All right, so last week there was an abortion debate on the Whatever Podcast. I say debate because it was really a barely moderated dialogue rather than a debate. It was two pro-lifers, Kristen Hawkins of Students for Life of America and Lila Rose of Live Action, versus a self-described pro-abortion YouTuber named Destiny. And man, I am not kidding, this was painful to review. It's four hours long, and it took me forever to watch and make notes because I just couldn't handle how awkward and unproductive it was. Everyone was talking past each other, interrupting, and sometimes they would just needlessly attack the other person. It was a missed opportunity for the pro-life position. Though I was impressed when Lila Rose admitted to interrupting too much, and in the dialogue, she promised to do better. Life seems to be the cessation of a Why conscious experience. To measure Hold on, let him finish. Let him finish. Let him finish. Sorry, excuse me. Sorry, go ahead. More interruptions Good point. Okay. No, that's so, okay. Have you been one? Just, just, just let me finish. Listen. Yeah. Thank you. Destiny, you need to start asking them to restate your position back to you. It's becoming exceedingly obvious that they are either not listening or responding in bad faith. Lila <laughs> seems like she's kind of trying, though. So shout out to Lila. Uh, Dr. Ocho, thank you. I'm trying to do better. I, I'm okay. truly. <laughs> now, look, I try to not be overly critical of people in these situations. I have been in the hot seat. I have done debates and dialogues where I didn't phrase things exactly how I would have wanted. And I've also had dialogues with non-Catholics where I interrupted too much, and the commenters let me know that, and I've tried to get better at that. It happens. So my goal in this video is not to dump on Lila or Kristen. They do great work, and it's easy for me to give arguments in this video after the fact at my own pace. Instead, my goal is to examine the arguments and the methods that were used and just help all of us better defend the pro-life position. All right, so let's look at Destiny's main argument for abortion. Then I'll talk about the stuff that Lila and Kristen said that I didn't find to be very helpful. So Destiny's main argument is that abortion might kill a living human entity, but it does not kill a person with a right to life. He says a person is something that is presently capable of conscious experiences. And he says unborn human beings only develop this ability about 20 to 24 weeks after conception. So he would support allowing abortion up to 20 weeks. That would cover about 99% of all abortions. A person, when we say who is suffering, we don't say what is suffering. We're not talking about a body. We're not talking about a heartbeat. We're talking about a person having an experience. So when I try to think of abortion, I try to think of who is being harmed. I would say that before 20 to 24 weeks, that's about when the scientists say that the brain has all the parts necessary to begin communicating, to have a conscious experience, that about at that point, there is some experience there that we can speak of as a who or as a person. But prior to that, the first trimester, that really experience is not happening yet. So if you want to have an abortion, there is no who that's being harmed. There's just a what, which is whatever the body is up to that point. Now, there's three ways you can show an argument to define personhood against the unborn fails. First, you could show that it includes beings we all agree are not persons, like non-human animals. In other words, the definition is too broad. Second, you could show it excludes beings we all agree are persons, like infants. Or you could show the definition is too narrow. Or you could show the definition is arbitrary. There's no good reason to accept it. An example of this would be the claim, a person is any human being who is born. In fact, at one point, Kristen accused Destiny of saying birth makes someone a person, and Destiny said he never made that argument, and he seems to imply that it's a bad argument. You're what? saying it's okay to kill it. So you're saying my kill vagina is magical. So something happened. No, first of all, as a child born by C-section, I'm very offended, okay? But We're humans too. Number one, no, taking. hold on. Is it hold something? On. Wait, 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 hold on. Wait, 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 wait. The vagina magic guy is not in the room right now. I oh, didn't yeah. give any qualification about birth being the magical time that made somebody a human. I've never said that ever. So I have no idea what position you're attacking there. In fact, Destiny debated atheist Matt Dillahunty on the bodily rights argument for abortion. And Destiny said the bodily rights argument does not work if the fetus is a person because parents have moral duties to their children. So we can affirm that Destiny is generally right about the duty that parents owe to their unborn children. He's just wrong about unborn children not being persons. 
Before I get to the exclude-include problems of his definition, let's ask why we should accept Destiny's definition in the first place. He says we should accept it because people care about consciousness more than they care about life as an organism. Destiny says our willingness to withdraw life support from permanently unconscious people, like, as he claims, Terry Schiavo, shows that we believe a person dies when she permanently loses consciousness. Notice when you guys were talking about Terry Schiavo, the thing that you were trying to say was, hold on, Terry Schiavo wasn't totally brain dead. She had an intellectual disability. That shows that you yourself were trying to grab at that idea that she still had some conscious experience. Because at the end of the day, we all know that's the only thing that matters. Destiny then makes a kind of symmetry argument, which says that if a person stops existing when consciousness is permanently lost, then a person must start existing when consciousness begins, which he says happens at around 20 to 24 weeks after conception. Yeah, actually, we never got to that. Why did you become pro-abortion? Um, because I did a greater analysis of when death happens, and then I realized that saying that life begins at the moment of conception doesn't make sense unless you say death begins the moment all of your body disappears. It doesn't make sense. Why do the markers for life and death have to be the same thing? Um, the beginning well, because generally life. when we talk about why a thing exists, if we're trying to figure out like when a thing starts, sometimes we look at when a But thing we know. Ends. Um, so when I, when I think of like, when I'm, when I'm instructive on like, how could I end a life? And what is the end of life? None of it revolves around reception to pain, heartbeat, unique DNA, all of it seems to revolve around this conscious experience. And I pick when life begins based on what I think life ends, because I think that's about what we're worried about protecting. What are we protecting when we talk about human life? It's It's not a body, it's not a cell, it's not a heartbeat. We're protecting their conscious experience. Right away, there's a problem with this argument. The fact that many people would withdraw medical care for a permanently unconscious person does not show they think the person has died. All it shows is that most people would not want to live in that condition, or they think others would not want to live in that condition. But there can be cases where a person exists, but many people think they should be allowed to die or would even want to euthanize them because they think their life is not worth living. For example, imagine you were on a ventilator, but you were conscious and you were locked in. This is a condition where a person is aware of what's happening around them, but they cannot communicate, except maybe with their eyes. They're frozen. They cannot move. I'm sure some people would want the ventilator turned off because they'd rather be dead than locked in. Some would even want a feeding tube removed or would want to be given morphine and killed. But their opinions would not prove they were no longer a person, because destiny says consciousness makes you a person, and locked-in people definitely have consciousness. So even if many people would want to be taken off life support when they are permanently unconscious, that does not prove they're not persons since they might want the same lack of treatment for other conditions, even though they would still be a person, like being locked in. I'd also ask Destiny if it would be okay to just bury the breathing body of an unconscious person in a grave, let the dirt asphyxiate them. I mean, they can't feel pain, right? So why does it matter how we kill them? Why wait to starve them, or why waste morphine on them? But most people have an intuition that such a person is not truly dead, They're just profoundly disabled. So they would not be okay with taking a permanently unconscious person who is still breathing and then just throwing them in a grave and burying them. Destiny's strategy tries to show the pro-life view of personhood fails because it includes the permanently unconscious and would require keeping them alive forever. But as Lila and Kristen point out to him, you can believe someone is a person and withdraw extraordinary means of care that are used to keep them alive. 88-year-olds who have heart attacks are persons, but they might not want CPR performed on them because they don't want to live for a few more years with broken ribs that come from chest compressions, for example. Destiny's symmetry argument can be reworked to say that a person begins to exist when he first has biological coordination, which would be a fertilization, the time when all the parts work together for the whole. And a person stops existing when the parts don't do this anymore, and the person is a decaying corpse, which most people would say happens at total brain death. If someone is dying or has died, we may choose to not give them extraordinary medical care. But they are still a person if they are dying or they've just lost consciousness, and that's a point that Kristen and Lila made well in the discussion. The position that actually suffers from the over-inclusion problem is destinies. Because his definition of consciousness is so vague, it can include non-human animals, which is a point that was only briefly touched upon in the debate. 
When we think about vegans and why vegans defend animals, they're not defending animal bodies, animal hearts, whatever. They're defending the animal's conscious, the sentient conscious mm -hmm. experience of the animal. That's why I say if life all ends that way and can be ended that way, that's probably when life begins. To demonstrate the inclusion problem, I would ask Destiny if a human newborn is a person. Destiny said it does not matter the degree of consciousness a person has. It just matters whether you are conscious or not. And if you are, then you are a person. And Destiny says an infant is a person, even though they have minimal consciousness. He also uses the examples of a football player, that the football players on a team might have varying levels of skill as players. Some might be really good, some might be really bad or barely able to play football at all. But there's a binary. You're either on the team or you're not on the team. Much the same way with consciousness, there's a binary. Even though some people might have minimal amounts of consciousness, like an infant, they're still a person, even if other people have a lot more consciousness. There's a binary of are you an NFL player or not. What's However, people that are there could be people that are better NFL players than other NFL players, but there could still be the binary of if you are or you aren't. Was there a um, player is a little bit less of a person than yeah, a, than a Yeah, but there's still a binary of do you have consciousness or not. Once you have it, you can talk about degrees of consciousness. And that I can I can guess what it's like to be a baby. There's probably a lot of new sensations. You're probably having crazy temperature adjustments. You're probably seeing a whole bunch of stuff and really squinting away from it. I can guess what it's like to, I don't know exactly. I can't guess what it's like to be a thing without a brain. Okay, then what about animals like dogs or pigs or rats? that have more consciousness than a newborn. These non-human animals can recognize people, they can perform tasks like solving mazes. Does that make a rat a person? If it does, then Destiny has to accept that people who fumigate rats should go to prison for life, just as they should be permanently locked up if they used poison gas on unwanted toddlers. But if it doesn't, if rats aren't people under this view, then that shows consciousness is not what makes something a person, and his whole argument collapses. Since people are much more confident about the permissibility of killing rats than they are about the permissibility of killing permanently unconscious human beings, that counts against Destiny's view and towards the pro-life view. Destiny also cannot say, well, a newborn is going to become more rational later, so they're a person, because he repeatedly said the pro-life view can't rest on the fact that a fetus will become rational later. Also, you could just modify the example to have a human being who permanently stays at the level of a newborn, psychologically. Under Destiny's view, that would be a person, but so would a rat that has similar levels of consciousness, something which most people would consider to be absurd. The next way to go after Destiny's argument would be to bring up the problem of excluding people who we all agree are persons. If Destiny had just said you need the level of consciousness that surpasses non-human animals to be a person, then that would exclude infants, and it'd be game over for his view for almost everybody. But since Destiny had a broad definition of consciousness, it suffers more from the inclusion problem than the exclusion problem. So Lila and Kristen's focus on exclusion examples isn't as helpful. For example, Lila pointed out that comatose people, sleeping people, people under anesthesia, they don't have the capacity to be conscious. To which Destiny said those people do have the capacity to be conscious because they have the biological parts necessary for consciousness. Those parts just can't function because they're blocked at the moment. Is there's a difference between a thing and a thing that something will become. Those are two fundamentally different things. So when you say, what's the difference between a fetus that hasn't developed the parts to have consciousness yet versus what's Excuse the difference me. between me? The fetus. I told Wait. you she wouldn't let me finish. Versus just, what's the difference between just, me just who's currently finish. unconscious and will become conscious later after anesthesia will wake up. The difference is, is you're not developing the capacity to have consciousness. There's a continuation of a prior conscious experience. All the parts are there to create a conscious experience. They're just temporary, Destiny. temporarily the alleviated. Destiny. They're just, no, it's not because Hold the on, fetus let, has let, never let, been let, conscious and doesn't have the parts to deploy let the consciousness experience. So there's fundamentally a difference. Was that two or three interruptions that I said were going to happen, right? There's fundamentally a difference between a thing doesn't even have the capability to to have a conscious experience versus somebody else's is temporarily abated by a drug. When do you not not become a person? When you when no longer can deploy a conscious experience. Well, then experience. It, if you're asleep then, or if you're, you're in, under the anesthetic. The between somebody who's asleep. What's the difference between somebody experience? who's asleep or when I'm under, dead? When I'm under anesthetic. You can wake up. Why do you keep using okay. this as an example? Because because with an embryo, you can develop. You can't you wake an embryo you, up. They don't have the parts no, yet. We need to distinguish immediate capacities from natural capacities. I have the immediate capacity to speak English. I'm doing it right now. I have the natural capacity to speak Mandarin. I can't speak Mandarin right now, but I could if I studied and practiced. A rock has neither the immediate nor natural capacity to speak any language. 
When it comes to consciousness, an unborn child before 20 weeks has the natural capacity to be conscious, but he does not have the immediate capacity to be conscious. Just as an infant has the natural capacity to procreate, but he won't have the immediate capacity to procreate until puberty. A comatose, sleeping, or anesthetized person has an immediate capacity for consciousness that is blocked by something. All of the parts that are necessary for consciousness are present in the body. There is just something keeping the parts from working, like anesthesia preventing signals from traversing the nervous system. To make an analogy, a car has the immediate capacity to be driven, even if the battery is unhooked. But a car whose engine still needs to be built doesn't have an immediate capacity to be driven. It doesn't have a natural capacity either because it's a constructed object. But I'll talk about that a little later. Destiny would say a person is anyone who has the immediate capacity to be conscious or who has those biological parts for consciousness. It does not apply to anyone who still needs to develop the parts in the brain necessary for consciousness. People in comas or are sleeping have those biological features, so they're persons under Destiny's view, just as a car has an engine that you might have to turn on to get it to go anywhere. Now, there was a lot of arguing in this section about whether unborn children have the capacity to be conscious, but what was happening is that everyone was talking past each other. Lila and Kristen were talking about natural capacities, and Destiny was talking about immediate capacities. In order to show Destiny's view of personhood excludes people, we need an example of a born person that people agree is a person and has the natural but not immediate capacity to be conscious. Something close to this example comes up about three hours into the conversation, when a questioner asks about an unconscious person whose brain needs to regrow before he will be conscious again. Better come example, the patient had a traumatic uh, brain injury where if left to its own device, its uh, its own Device. Its own devices will heal in approximately nine months to a point of regaining consciousness, as you have defined it. Would termination of this human be acceptable? No. I believe this no. is... No? Okay. All right, Matt. So why is that the case then for a okay. child? Why is a conscious experience? Why? Until the capacity to play it, there's some healing process, and then it will play it again. Back and forth on this brief. No, if, wait, if it's okay. We okay. went through it. He, there's no answer sure. for why. The answer is the child has not had a conscious experience. There's no conscious experience. But there's no logical of. reason why. That is logical. It, it didn't exist. But why does that provide not having the moral I am Stephen. Of when I go to sleep, there was a Stephen, and there will be a Stephen. No, I if I have a trend of danger, there was Stephen, there will be a Stephen. Yes. When I was an embryo, there was never a Stephen Destin, to speak of. Destin. Destiny says you would still be a person in that case because your previous conscious experiences would return. First, this contradicts his definition. He said a person must have an immediate capacity for consciousness. Someone whose brain has to regrow does not have that capacity. A person might have existed before the injury. Maybe the person will come back after they're healed. But under Destiny's view, no person can exist when the body is in a brain-damaged coma. Second, in such a scenario, it seems unlikely that the same personality and memory will return if those areas of the brain have to be regrown. So we can offer other hypotheticals of a born person with a natural capacity for consciousness that people would generally say are people that shows his definition fails. One example would be a newborn infant who ne was never conscious at all, but after birth will be conscious in a few weeks. Most people would say that that infant is a person, even though under Destiny's view, he would not be a person because he'd never been conscious. Or how about this? Imagine my one-year-old has a brain injury, and doctors can regrow part of his damaged brain. He will be conscious again in a few weeks, but he will have lost all of his conscious experiences and operate at the level of a newborn. This would be tragic, but my child would not be dead. The person would still exist. I would certainly prefer to find out he had this tragic injury than was simply brain dead and was now a decomposing corpse. Since most people share that intuition, this shows that the permanent loss of consciousness is not what causes a person to stop existing. It might end a personality, but not the person himself. My one-year-old and a 19-week-old fetus would be in exactly the same position. They each have to wait for their brain to grow before a new set of conscious experiences begins to occur. The fact that the one-year-old used to have experiences cannot be grounds for saying he's still a person in his comatose state, because those past experiences will never return. They're gone forever. 
But if you agree my one-year-old is still a person, albeit a very disabled one, then the 19-week-old fetus would also be a person as well. Destiny also seems to be focusing on harm and persistence of consciousness. He says the reversibly comatose are persons because they had desires prior to being unconscious, and those desires will return after they become conscious. But as we saw, this does not explain the wrongness of killing a born human who permanently loses his memories, a point Lila brings up regarding amnesia, and Destiny even admits amnesia is a difficult case for him. For a sleeping person, when you go to sleep tonight, you have had a full subjective experience right now. When you wake up, that experience will resume, but a baby hasn't but even begun. But Destiny, what if I have amnesia and I don't remember anything? I'm like a brand new first moment of consciousness human being. And during when, my when and during my coma, yeah. during my coma, I lose all memory. I lose all, lose all sense of my personhood. And when I emerge from my coma, I am like a brand new baby. Would it have been okay during that coma to kill me? Ooh, I would have to think a lot about that question. So the issue. Have you thought about it before? The, no, I've thought about it a great deal, but the question is way more complicated than than you seem to think it is. Okay, but that's not an easy question. Second, Destiny's view assumes you can only be harmed if you have conscious experiences or desires that are frustrated, but that's not true. If an unborn child stood to gain an inheritance and the money is stolen from him before he's born, the child has been harmed, even though he was not and may never be consciously aware of what happened to him. The same is true if his life is taken from him without his conscious awareness either. Another problem with Destiny's view is that he assumes when a fetus develops the organs necessary for consciousness, it becomes a new kind of thing, when in reality, it's the same kind of thing. It just has a new ability. People are living organisms that develop. They're not constructed objects like a car. At one point, Destiny said that an embryo was like a blueprint, or he said that knocking over steel columns isn't the same as destroying a building. That's true, but human beings are not constructed like buildings. Lila actually gave a decent example of a self-building car being a car through its whole existence. But in these kinds of conversations, I like to use Richard Stith's Polaroid analogy. Imagine you saw the aliens that landed in Nevada, allegedly, a few weeks ago, and you took a picture of them with your Polaroid camera before they went back to outer space. When the picture comes out, it's just a brown smudge. Your friend then tears up the picture. He says, well, it was only a potential picture of aliens. It's not an actual picture. We value pictures of aliens, not brown smudges that could maybe become pictures. People don't buy smudges, they buy pictures of aliens. But that's not right. What matters is the picture of the alien itself, which did exist, it just had not finished developing yet. And when destroying it, the picture is gone forever. Likewise, what matters for human beings is not that they're presently conscious, but they're the kind of being who can be conscious. A person always exists throughout his development of different abilities. And if you destroy that person, before they develop various abilities, then that person, that unique, unrepeatable person, will never exist again. Finally, Destiny said that you are your brain, which means that you are just the parts of the brain that cause consciousness to exist. He claims this is true by asking Lila and Kristen if they would still be a person if you replaced every part of their body with an electronic component. And then when I think of like all the ways that I could replace parts of the body, if I replace the heart, that's probably still a person, the arms, every single thing. But when you start replacing the brain, something unique seems to be happening there. It seems like we are our brains, the experiences, the memories, the subjective conscious interpretation of the world. That seems to be the thing that's really important to defend. Of her okay, being here's people question. in the room let's saying she's alive. Person, and let's say that you chop off their arm and you replace it with a bionic arm. Is that still a person? Okay, let's say yes, you chop off a leg absolutely. and replace it with a leg. Is it still a person? Yes. What if you get rid of the heart and replace it with a bionic heart? Is that still a person? Yes, and then at some point... What if you replace... Run now, let's say we've got a full human. What if you just replace the brain? Is that still the same person? There have... I mean, yeah, if that's possible. I mean, if you, if you get to that point. Okay. Destiny has not shown that we are identical to our brains. All he has shown is that in human organisms, we can be reduced to the brain if you have other life support, in the same way a tree is not identical to its trunk, but you can trim a tree all the way to the trunk and it's still the same tree. If you replace someone's body with electronic parts so that they stopped being an organism that is assisted by cybernetics and became cybernetics that just kind of looks like an organism, then I would say the person has died and a robot that thinks they have the same memories now exists. 
even if you just replace the brain, you will have destroyed the organ that allows all the other parts to work together in a coordinated fashion. That's also assuming that the same memories would persist, but there's good reason to think that machines can never be conscious. They can only mimic conscious behaviors. I'd also point out that you have the, the same puzzles for Destiny's view, even if this were possible. If you, what if you copied the person's brain and created a robot with the same memories and personality? Would that be the same person? Well, it can't be, because that's a contradiction. You can't be identical to two different people, which shows we're not identical to consciousness. Or what if you cut my brain in half, and you put each half into two brainless corpses, and each of them wake up and they think they're me? They can't both be me. What happened is when you did that, I died, because I as an organism ceased to exist, and two other corpses were reanimated and had my memories, but they weren't me because I am not just a bundle of conscious experiences. I am a living human being or a human organism. Destiny also claims that if you separated someone's head from his body, you would choose to keep the head alive rather than the torso because you just are your brain. You're Let's say that you could cut my body, dis dis right. dis dis cut my neck off, right? You cut right. dismember of the neck. Let's say you can choose to keep one thing alive, mm -hmm. my head and put it on another body or the r whole rest of my body and put another head on. What would you choose to make it me? I'd say you are the brain and the body. You are now just separated from each other, just as my leg could be amputated and put somewhere else and it would still be my leg. We'd keep the brain alive instead of the torso because the heart and lungs can be replaced with a machine, but the brain cannot be replaced with a machine that keeps the body alive in the same way. Our decision says nothing about whether you are identical to the features of the brain that cause consciousness. This is why I'd also point out that abortion is a controversial issue, so we can't resolve it with hypotheticals like brain transplants that are even more controversial than the controversial issue we're trying to resolve in the first place. When dealing with controversy, you should use simpler examples to deal with the controversy. And Lila does a good job of bringing the discussion back, saying that even if these impossible things could happen, they don't answer the question of what we can or cannot kill. Whether or not you can, we had the technology to put a new brain in someone else's brain, mm -hmm. right? Or we had the technology to cut off your head, put on somebody else, and then put a different head on that other body. I mean, the question of, is that person still destiny or is that a new person those are questions to explore mm -hmm. but in both cases it would be wrong to kill destiny with a new body that maybe is part destiny or destiny with a new brain that's maybe part destiny so before we continue i just want to summarize the problems with destiny's position on abortion he has not shown personhood is identical to immediate capacities for consciousness because how we treat dying unconscious people doesn't resolve that issue. Moreover, his brain transplant hypotheticals are too controversial to help us address an already controversial issue, and you get the same paradoxes and things like creating multiple minds in these cases, so overall they don't help his position. But when it comes to the exclusion-inclusion arguments, that's where his case really falters, because his consciousness-based requirement would include non-human animals like rats that have minimal consciousness, and it would make them persons, which most people reject, and it would exclude some disabled born people, like temporarily comatose newborns. All right, now let's talk about some of the arguments the three made that weren't very helpful. For example, Kristen asked Destiny, what if he's wrong on abortion? And she implied that Destiny should be pro-life because if he's wrong on abortion, he defended millions of deaths. But if Kristen's wrong about abortion, she only caused women to be inconvenienced. If yep. I am wrong, yep. and this is really magical, yep. what right. I have done in my life's work in advocating against abortion uh -huh. is saying that women who may not want to carry, gestate another human being in their womb for nine months had to be inconvenienced. That's what if I am wrong. Okay. But, but if you're wrong, you've just said 60 million, 60 people plus million people. people were killed. But Destiny correctly points out that you cannot compare two positions only by the consequences of each position being wrong. You also have to compare the probability that each position is right, along with the consequences of each position being wrong. 
or what's, what would be worse, being wrong here or being wrong yeah. here? What I have to think of is what is the probability of being wrong on both ends? It's not just a one-to-one -one because I'm not going to sit here and pretend that everything is a one-to-one, -one, like there's an equal chance of being right or wrong here. I feel very strongly about my, my position, about being pro-choice. So I'm not weighting this as a 50% chance of being right here and a 50% chance of being right here. So the question doesn't make sense. So I'm saying it's a meaningless question. You, you can't just win a debate on whether people should be vegans by saying if meat eaters are wrong, they tortured millions of animals. And if vegans are wrong, they only inconvenience people. Or you can't win a debate on lockdowns during COVID by saying, well, if anti-lockdown people are wrong, they'll kill millions of people. And if pro-lockdown people are wrong, they will have only inconvenienced people. Inconvenience is an understatement. And if pro-lifers are wrong, they would be oppressing women. That's why you have to weigh the probability of each position being right or wrong, along with the consequences of the positions being right or wrong. Now, I think it's fair to point out that we don't demolish a building if we reasonably think a person could still be inside. When applying this to abortion, if someone is truly on the fence about abortion, this kind of argument can be helpful. But if a person is as confident that abortion is not wrong as the typical meat eater is confident that eating meat is not wrong, the argument from what if you're wrong, it's not, it's not going to be very effective. Now, one fallacy Destiny made involved poisoning the well. He accused Lila and Kristen of being unwilling to change their minds on this issue because they make money from talking about abortion and being involved in pro-life organizations, whereas he is allegedly free to believe whatever he wants. Have you ever considered that you could be wrong on this issue? Yeah, of course. What, Have you? What? Absolutely. Hold on. Only one, Absolutely. To be clear, only one side of the table here is tied to organizations that are getting money invested in them. And so well, if any started, side here who's going to- I started my I understand, but so. you're never changing your position. I'm still free to change mine. So in terms of asking me if I consider that's I'm wrong, asking. I can consider that I'm wrong. You guys will never change your opinion on this. Now, this could just be an observation that he's making, but if it's being used to undermine Kristen or Lila in any way in the case that they're making, then it would be an ad hominem fallacy. The strength of a person's argument has no bearing on whether the person gains something from defending the argument. I can't refute an abortionist's argument for abortion by just saying, well, he makes money from abortions. What do you expect he's going to say? Also, some people have changed their minds and quit their jobs as a result in the issue of abortion. Bernard Nathanson was an abortionist who became pro-life. Lots of other abortionists have done the same. And the Protestant Reverend Rob Shank used to work for groups that fought abortion and wanted to make it illegal, and now he's totally pro-choice and supports legal abortion. But mostly this argument is a variation of the ad hominem fallacy, one we shouldn't have in a debate. Now, at one point, Lila and Kristen focus on the fact that Destiny did not know exactly when consciousness begins. So he would propose that the law ought to make a cutoff at 20 weeks, which would be the earliest point for him. He thinks consciousness is 20 to 24 weeks, so maybe the law should just have a cutoff at 20 weeks then. Lila and Kristen then said that Destiny was contradicting himself because he says consciousness emerges in a range, 20 to 24 weeks, but he's now saying that 20 weeks is the cutoff, uh, as if he's changing from 24 to 20 weeks and that his position's being weakened somehow. All of this led to this unfortunate exchange between Destiny and Kristen. So the child who's born at 21 weeks and six days, mm -hmm. or the fetus or whatever. That would be past the policy what, cost. What, You'd probably say at that what, point, yeah, it should probably be. Destiny's hypothetical world. This is Destiny's hypothetical yeah. world. If you're there at the delivery room, uh -huh. Oh, are you saying that that child can be killed because we don't know what that child's consciousness is? In Destiny's level hypothetical is. world, if is we it, draw on the line at 20 weeks, if the child is born at 21 weeks, we'd probably say, okay, well, now that it's so 20, now it's going to be true. So you your position in this debate. You went from 20 to 24 weeks, and now you're down to 20, right? Do you understand the difference between a policy position versus like an epistemic statement or like a moral statement? Yes, I'm not, a, I'm not a moron. Thank you. Okay. I well, love how then you I don't, these well, questions. Like, I don't know do why you, you understand there's a difference between the color blue yeah, I, and the color purple. Okay. I'm not really sure. Yeah. I don't know. I've never talked to a misogynistic man like this before. Okay. All right. I still want to so, know if you think that you don't want to know anything. Things. I think you answer your question. So, Wait. When it comes to attitudes, Destiny was condescending in this dialogue. And in other parts of the exchange, the host, Brian, said that he was being a troll. But Kristen did not have to call him a misogynist over and over and over again. Yeah. I don't know. I've never talked to a misogynistic man like this before. The ability to either respond to misogynist, come on. It's not misogynist, okay? Um, now, that is misogyny, because what you're saying is— I'm back to my misogynistic energy, yeah. 
in the womb yes. and let me, be let me productive answer. citizens of our society. So they should. That, that's exactly, that is misogyny, So, Destiny, I, I don't that's know exactly that. Hold on, I, let's let Lila okay, go. Go ahead, Lila. I think your question might betray. When you do something like this, it just gets weaponized against you. Destiny even includes this on his own highlight summary of the debate. I mean, if I debated a feminist on abortion and she kept calling me a misogynist over and over and over again, this would just hurt her cause. Even people sympathetic to her might start being sympathetic towards me. So I strongly recommend against this kind of approach in a dialogue. Also, just because Destiny does not know when consciousness begins, that doesn't disprove his argument. He can draw the line for legal protection to be right before consciousness is able to happen. Pro-lifers have to do the same thing. There's a range of time when the heart forms, but we just draw the line at six weeks for simplicity. Fertilization or conception is not a moment. It's a process that takes place over 24 to 48 hours. But we can still pick a moment after the cells combine and say that's when a new life begins, even if it's possible it began earlier. So we don't want to make too much of a fuss about defining life or personhood based on ranges, because that can be used against us. Next, Destiny provides a clever response to a common pro-life argument dealing with personhood. Kristen says that whenever we've said in the past that humans were not persons, society was wrong. So what are the odds we're correct now when many people in society say the unborn are not persons? But Destiny says that whenever society in the past said that women don't deserve certain rights, society was wrong. So what are the odds society is right now when they say women don't deserve the right to have an abortion? So if you're going to make, if you're gonna make no an argument that like, oh, well, either. viewing people as people sometimes and not is really problematic, then I'll say, okay, well, restricting rights from people, especially women, has also been really problematic yeah. historically. Oh. Welcome to women's suffrage. Welcome to women being able to own property. Welcome to women having access to birth control. Thank Welcome you for to women explaining women's, women's rights. rights. I, no problem. I'll do it since you guys have the problem with so, the understanding. Yeah, it's a clever response, but only because it misdefines the oppression of women. When women were denied the right to vote or the right to go to college, they were denied things men had a right to obtain. That's why it was unjust. But no one says that men should be allowed to have abortions and women should not be. So this is not a case of taking away rights from women in that sense by making abortion illegal. You'd have to reformulate the argument to talk about taking away rights from women that are unique to women that have nothing to do with men having those same rights. And the number of those cases is going to be vanishingly small. But there are many cases of human beings being wrongly depersonalized throughout history. So while I don't think that Kristen made a misstep here, it's good to know about how pro-choicers can make a clever pivot on this argument. Now, one unhelpful thing that did happen was Lila and Kristen's unwillingness to engage Destiny's hypotheticals. For example, when Destiny asked whether a permanently unconscious human being was a person— Lila and Kristen instead quibbled about whether we could ever know someone is permanently unconscious. Sorry, that's yeah. an absurd no, proposition to imagine a person could be in a coma. I said you needed to provide more information. Was it a medically induced coma? How long was the coma? These these questions matter. Let's and actually, ask me, what, what is I the question? Ask a very simple what? question. There, What's yes, the question? A person is in a bed. person is in a bed. This person is unconscious in a coma. The doctor has a machine and he pushes the button. The machine says this person will never wake up again. But the rest There's of their no body works. Like that, that exists. That's why it's called a hypothetical. And it's hypothetical, like hypothetical means destiny because it doesn't exist in the real world. That's it. Yeah. You're inventing a false hypothetical that doesn't exist in the real world. That is so and, it, it, and it, human it, life dying. Yeah. So so, it's, so, it's so and you're risky. using it if, to if you can't, if you can't, if you ending can't, the life yeah. of an embryo. You can't adjust this. or a, a human being. I wouldn't so debate Dave facto if you're if you're incapable of 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 dealing with hypothetical. Then the conversation is like deal with hypothetical. You can't. You can't. A hypothetical, by definition, is something that is not happening. That's why it's called a hypothetical. Now, it is fair to bring up the fact that people unexpectedly come out of supposedly permanent comas. But for the purpose of moral discussion, Destiny's point is fair, because there are also cases where people never come out of comas, and we're pretty sure that's what's going to happen. In fact, I could steel man Destiny's position and ask Lila and Kristen, would it be murder to take an anencephalic infant, a baby born with only a brainstem, off of a heart-lung machine that is keeping him alive. A pro-lifer can say it's not murder because the right to life does not include the right to be kept alive in an extraordinary way, like with a heart-lung machine. In this case, you would be keeping a dying person alive, that the care is futile. 
However, we should always provide people, even permanently comatose people, with basic care, like food and water, unless that would harm them. For example, some dying people don't eat food right before they die because that would cause them pain, it doesn't help them, but we should not starve or dehydrate anyone to death. And Lila and Kristen do make this point in the dialogue, though sometimes it was confused with the distinction between active and passive killing rather than ordinary and extraordinary care. Another argument Destiny makes against the pro-life position is that human embryos are not people because pro-lifers don't allegedly treat human embryos like people. For example, why don't pro-lifers do more to prevent miscarriages? Destiny also says that abortion is just not a big deal because millions of embryos die from miscarriages anyways. If at the moment of, no, you can't right now. If you believe that at the moment of conception you've created a unique human being, then that means that right now you should be in tears because at every moment women that are engaged, in fact, yes. you could probably make the argument that sex without the intention of immediately going to a hospital is probably immoral because you're engaging in some activity that might result in the death of a child yes, in two or three or four weeks wait. because you don't know if you're going to have a miscarriage. Every single time, a human every being, single time I, a woman has sex, guys, one of the, please, 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 please. That's, that's the result of your recklessness. Like tens of millions of children dying every day to accidental miscarriages anyway, so it's not like that much worse. First, even if human embryos died of miscarriages at a high rate, that doesn't disprove the pro-life view. Throughout most of human history, child mortality was 50%. Half of all children died before they reached the age of five. But we would consider a medieval civilization monstrous if millions of toddlers were legally killed in it, and the justification was, well, it's not that big a deal, millions of children die naturally anyways. Likewise, pro-lifers are not inconsistent if they focus on making it illegal to kill human beings before they try to solve every natural threat to the life of a human being, whether they're born or unborn. Also, we recognize that children born and unborn are persons, even though we might disagree about how much risk you should expose them to. Toddlers are persons, but we don't ban people from smoking in their homes, even though there is a chance secondhand smoke could harm a toddler living in that house. We don't demand every infant sleep in a monitored hospital because some children die of SIDS. We have a level of risk tolerance for born and unborn people, so pro-lifers don't have to demand that pregnant women be sequestered in hospitals. And Lila and Kristen rightly point out that that would be a stressful situation that's more likely to cause a miscarriage. Now, in some cases, it'll be obvious secondhand smoke or drug abuse is child abuse, and parents should lose custody of their kids in those cases, just like it's obvious using crack cocaine or binge drinking through pregnancy is a form of child abuse. In other cases, it's going to be open to interpretation, like the smoking of the occasional cigar in a home with a child, or having one glass of wine during pregnancy. But what we should all agree on is that it should just be illegal to directly kill a child, born or unborn. Moreover, the lack of emotional response to death does not prove the one who died is not a person. There are people dying all over the world today that you and I don't become emotional over, but they're still persons. If I found out I had a cousin I had never met, and then two months later I was told that cousin died, I'd be sad, but not as devastated as if it were a relative I knew more intimately. Likewise, different levels of grief with miscarriage only reflect how well a person knew the child, not whether the child is a person. And finally, many women do mourn the death of an unborn child in the same way they mourn the death of a born baby. And for example, they try to have the miscarried baby buried. If Destiny's position is correct, then they're deluded, because they're not persons. But since most people would not accept that they're deluded, this counts against Destiny's position. Likewise, most people agree that killing a pregnant woman is two counts of murder, not one. But you can't hold that position under Destiny's view of the unborn child not being a person. The law cannot treat an unborn child like a person simply because his mother believes he is a person. If someone kills your dog, they can't be tried for murder just because you value your dog like a person. The unborn can only be treated as persons under the law if they actually are persons. At one point, though, Destiny seemed uncomfortable explaining what the human embryo or fetus was prior to 20 weeks. Or can kill a human being. A human being, I probably wouldn't agree to those terms, no. Well, but you if you want me to say yes, to make you feel better first. So, so I think Destiny should have just clearly said, yeah, prior to 20 weeks, a human organism exists, but it's not a person. 
just as a human organism exists after a person stops existing because he's in an irreversible coma. He should have just owned his position, and then you could have a clear conversation about what's wrong with that position. At another point, Destiny said that it's a fetus. Kristen says fetus just means offspring, and Destiny said, yeah, but the etymology of the word fetus does not prove a human fetus is a person because just because of the meaning of the word. And I didn't think that this was helpful when Lila or Kristen would try to play like gotcha by saying, oh, you you called it a human life. He was just misspeaking. That's that's not what he meant. Human yeah, and I don't agree that a fetus is a living human. Well, Welcome to my argument from life two hours ago. Destiny, are they dead? Back to the argument that we if keep saying. Not, wait, hold on. You hold keep on. saying it's if consciousness, but you just said not it's not a living human yeah. being. Are they dead, Destiny? It is, it's not a person. It's not a person. It's in a womb that's who's not 12 said, weeks though. dead. Or is it alive? It's not a person. Is it? Wait, That's you just said, said no, you said. just said it wasn't a living human being. So answer In the sense question. that it's not a person. You can try to trap me on semantics, but everybody in the audience knows what I'm saying. When I think of all the ways that I could test for life or all the ways that I could destroy life, everything to me seems to revolve around a person having a conscious but experience. you know that it's a life before consciousness, no? You admitted that You earlier. admitted that earlier. What do you think I mean when I say a life? You mean a biological human life, no? We all agreed on that. Another point that got muddled was debating whether it is wrong to abort a child for eugenic reasons, such as if the child is mixed race. Destiny said it would be unethical. Lila and Kristen said, but if you're pro-abortion, how could that be? And Destiny rightly says you can consistently support legal abortion and oppose eugenics. But you just said... Okay, so, so if a woman has an abortion at 19 weeks for a eugenic reason because of the, the skin color of the baby, because she... Oh, that could be unethical, raped. sure. Yeah. That would be unethical. Yeah, that's yeah. the thing. Earlier, it wasn't unethical for a woman to get pregnant as a sexual fetish and continue to have abortions at 19 weeks because the 19-week-old baby is not a baby and not a human, not a person. So why would it be unethical to kill a 19-week-old who... Be based for a racist reason. I don't know if it's unethical to practice a sexual fetish. It might be unethical to design society with a racial vision in mind. So it is wrong to kill at 19 weeks for a race-based reason. Uh, I don't know if I care about killing the thing. I'm thinking more of the designing of a society based on race. You, it's always wrong to practice eugenics. Even on a 19-week-old pre-conscious. On anything. It's probably wrong to practice eugenics. But if pre-consciousness has no moral value, well, yeah, why, would it, why is it possible to even be racist against that 19-week-old? I didn't say being racist against a 19-year-old. I say you're practicing eugenics. Why, I don't know if there has to be... Eugenics to kill the 19 week old. I would say it would probably be unethical if you were to say that people should only breed with people of their own race. That that form of practicing eugenics is unethical, even though you're not, not killing anything at all. I said. I Hold said on. I know. You're I will say that some defenders of abortion in the past and even the present defend it for eugenic reasons. But you can be against eugenic abortions without being against all abortions. For example, imagine a woman goes to a doctor and says, Hey, I had intercourse with a racial minority, but I don't want a mixed race baby. Can you please destroy the man's sperm in my body? The doctor may say no, because that's a racist request. But if the woman was raped, she might say, can you destroy the rapist's sperm in my body? In that case, the doctor should say yes. Catholic hospitals even have explicit protocols to allow this. Just because it would be wrong to destroy sperm in some cases, like eugenics, that doesn't mean that it's always wrong to destroy sperm because you can destroy it in the rape case. Likewise, just because it would be racist to destroy human embryos for eugenic reasons, that wouldn't prove by itself that it's wrong to destroy human embryos in other cases. Now, I think that bringing up racist or sexist reasons to abort are great ways to undermine certain bodily rights arguments or arguments that just say abortion is a woman's choice. They just don't work against Destiny's particular argument. Finally, the three of them talked about the burning IVF lab scenario and whether you should save a toddler or a tray of embryos. I'm going to pass on discussing that right now because I believe it really deserves its own episode to address it. And there were other points that were brought up in the dialogue, but I don't want to go on too long for this episode. I think that all of the major points have been covered. The biggest thing being that Destiny's position on basing abortion on consciousness fails because there's no good reason to accept it in the first place, just because people would not want to live in a permanently unconscious state. It doesn't follow that they're no longer persons, because people might not want to live in various conscious states, like being locked in, and yet you would still be a person. The biggest problem with this view is that it includes non-human animals, because they also have minimal consciousness. It says that they're persons when 
Animals like rats are clearly not persons, and it would exclude some born persons, such as a newborn infant who uh, had never been conscious or someone whose brain needed to regrow its parts in order to be conscious again. Uh, so we see that Destiny's argument does not work. He has not refuted the pro-life position, though I wish that that had been made clearer uh, in the dialogue that Lila and Kristen had. I'm grateful they went on the show to talk about this and to engage others, uh, but I think that we have to be honest when certain arguments or methods are not effective so that we don't duplicate them in future exchange exchanges. All right, well, that does it for me. I hope this review was helpful. Look, once again, I'm not trying to attack anyone. I'm just trying to help all of us come closer to the truth by listening and thinking about this issue. I actually sent an invite to Destiny on Twitter to ask if he would like to dialogue on the issue publicly. Uh, I haven't heard back yet. So if you would like the two of us to have a dialogue or a debate on abortion, happy to do so. Shoot him a message. Let him know I'm interested. Also, guys, I know I've been saying this for a long time. I am so sorry. But the second edition of Persuasive Pro-Life, my the publisher, Catholic Answers, has told me it should be out in a few weeks, sometime in mid-July. I'll let you more know, know more about that when it's available. So thank you guys very much, and I hope you have a very blessed day. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to TrentHornPodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.